right now. My name is Stephen Mahalchek, and I'll start out a little bit about me. I have a little over 20 years experience in IT, and the reason I give this talk is um, I'm married, I have four kids. One has graduated from Matchbuff, and two are currently in Matchbuff, and one is slowly making her way into Matchbuff in the next couple of years. But um, when my oldest got into middle school, sixth, seventh grade, he started asking me questions about apps on phones. And being that I was an IT professional, I figured I knew pretty much all there was to know about those types of things. And I started digging in, and he was asking questions, and I came to find out that I didn't have the answers to all the questions he was asking me. And that kind of took me back. It helped me realize that I didn't have a firm grasp on everything that was happening out there. I knew a lot about the computers, but when it came to the handheld devices like the phones and tablets, there are applications that the kids were using that I was unaware of. I was unaware of what they did, how they used them, and how, you know, the main reason behind why they used them. So that caused me to spend quite a bit of time researching um, what it means to be safe with technology. Not just from a child's perspective, but also from a parent's perspective, what parents need to be aware of when dealing with uh, everything from cell phones to tablets and all these mobile devices that can access the internet. And what is out there um, for the kids to use as well as what's out there waiting for the kids to take advantage of them. So um, during that course and talking with other parents, I realized that most parents have no idea what kids are using these days and how they're using it and the dangers that do lay out there, or lie out there for uh, our kids. So today's agenda will go through one, social media sites, two, internet use, we'll go through pornography, cell phones, having a plan and what that means. And then at the end, I'll take questions. Um, I cover a lot of information and I go kind of fast. So if you have questions, jot them down and I'll address them at the end of the session. If we stop during the process, this will become a very long meeting. The well, first thing we do is I start out with a quiz, a true or false quiz. So my cell phone is a computer, true or false? Yes. Yes, true. That's correct. Number two, my kids don't seek out inappropriate websites like pornography, so they're safe when they're online. True or false? False. Very good. One in eight online searches are done for pornography. True or false? Sadly, that is true. Yeah. And that number keeps increasing. Um, a couple years ago, it was one in 10 online searches. Um, I just verified today, it's down to one in eight. Um, and they're predicting by 2020, it'll be one in every three searches is done for pornography. Number four, the majority of kids hide their online behavior. True or false? Most people get this one wrong. True, True very good. Most kids, even if they're not doing anything wrong online, hide their online behavior. And they do that for a number of reasons, and we'll discuss that later in the talk. But most kids don't want mom and dad to know what they're doing, whether it's good or bad or indifferent. So dealing with social media sites, the topics we'll discuss are what are social media sites and how are they used? Who is out there? Photos, texts, tweets, and your security, and what that means. Is private really private? Popular social media sites? And then what it means to be a friend to your child's online account. Seems kind of straightforward. So what are social media sites? Well, I went and I took a definition off of uh, Wikipedia. So it's kind of stale, kind of definition, but basically social media sites are bookmarking sites or community sites where people can share things of common interest. Okay. So that would cover um, some things that are shared. Uh, 
photos, music, links to websites, links to blogs, other websites, other social media sites. All those things are shared on social media sites. So now that we know what social media sites are, we have a good idea of what the foundation of that is, we discuss who is out there. And the fact is, everyone's on the internet these days, even when we don't realize it. If we're talking on our phone, if we're at work on the computer, these days with smart TVs, even if you're watching a television, you're most likely online, accessing the internet or accessing information from the internet. So we have this wide world that brings, we bring data and information and people into our house. So people who are out there, we have our doctors, lawyers, teachers, senior citizens, priests, neighbors, friends. But in that same token, we also have uh, pedophiles, convicted felons, identity thieves, and hate groups that are also out there. And a lot of them are actively targeting teens. And I'll go through exactly how and why a little bit later when we discuss things like pornography. So photos, text, tweets, and your security. The texts and tweets your kids do um, on social media sites, on their phone, that sort of thing, can actually come back and haunt them later in life. Um, and this is especially true when they're applying for college or applying for a job these days. Most colleges, and when I say most, I'd say it's up, upwards of 85, 90%, hire companies to do background checks. They do what they call your social footprint check. So college won't necessarily go out there and background check your child, but they'll pay another company to take your child's college application and go through and see what they've posted on Facebook, the types of things that they tweet about on blogs that are common. Do they have pictures up on various social media sites like Instagram and stuff like that, Pinterest? And they put together a very comprehensive profile of your child. And they could tell, is this child into a hate group? Is this child into pornography? Is this child like tweeting and sending pictures of themselves online? Do they say hurtful comments online? All those things get tracked. That's why as parents, it's really important for us to remember to emphasize the importance of being modest when they're online. As parents, we teach our kids, you know, when you're in a social gathering, you know, you introduce yourself, you have a firm handshake, look the person in the eye, introduce yourself. But we never really think about the fact that we really need to teach them how do you act when you are online? How do you act when you send an email? How do you act when you're on a chat room? And the real thing is, our kids tend to think they're in anonymous when they're online. And we'll go through that a little bit later when we talk about smartphones. The biggest thing everybody does these days is they share photos online. And photos are not always private. Um, photos do contain geographic information known as geotagging. And to give you an example of that, um, I took a picture of this Max Lakato book called God's Story. And I took that picture and I uploaded it into a website that allows me to extract the data from that picture. And I don't know if you can see it too well, but right about there you have latitude and longitude. Your phone has a GPS. Your digital camera has a GPS. You take a picture, it knows exactly where you're, you're taking that picture from. This website's even so nice that they give me a little Google map here and put a little pin, it's kind of hard to see, right there, of where that latitude and longitude is. And I can actually zoom into the street level and realize I took that picture of that book at the Barnes & Noble on Colorado Boulevard. And these days with the GPS's and the phones and the cameras, they're accurate within 10 feet or so. So, with your friends uploading all those pictures on the Facebook and stuff, 
Facebook does a good job of masking that information on Facebook. But you can always download a picture off of Facebook to your computer, upload it to a site like that, and find out exactly where that picture was taken. So let's say you took a picture of your kid's birthday party. You throw it up on Facebook. I spend about 10, 15 hours a week on Darknet. I don't know if you guys know what Darknet is. It's the underbelly of the website, of the internet. Researching things like this. And I learned this little trick in a chat room with a pedophile. That's how they track kids online. Same for video? Mm -hmm. Videos, pictures. A lot of times if you take a screenshot of your cell phone, that'll have the geographic information as well. <clears throat> How determined do you have to be to find the website? Does <laughs> <laughs> every person know how to find the website? It's really easy. It's really easy. It's a simple, it's a simple Google search, and there's hundreds of them, some for better than others. But, um, you know, come on in. But the, the folks you don't want your children associating with, they know where to look because they share the information amongst themselves. And knowing to go to the to dark net and looking at that information, it's a very scary place out there <laughs> on the dark net because there are no restrictions. What you see in the pornography and stuff like that online, you're seeing about 10%. The 90% of the stuff that you don't see on the regular internet that we all access every day is downright scary. Come on in. So next topic, is private really private? Well, not necessarily. Not necessarily. A lot of web browsers, in fact all of them today, have a private feature, or if you're using like Chrome, an incognito feature. And it says it doesn't track your history. It doesn't track cookies, stuff like that. The fact is, what it does is it simply doesn't show you that information. As an IT person, knowing what to look for, you can find that data and it's quite easy. There are uh, cookies and malware that specifically go after that information and report it back. Because usually what you're doing in private mode is accessing your bank, accessing pornography, or accessing a hate group. Those are the three big things. And they could care less most of the time about the pornography or about the hate group. They're looking for information like your bank account, your login information, and they can track all of that. So private isn't really private. Another thing is websites load what are known as cookies. And cookies are pretty harmless. They're snippets of code that help a lot of times marketing departments research information about you when you're online. Um, but cookies can also lead to spam and anything that you get in, I consider spam as anything you get that you didn't request, for the most part is spam. You see that in your inbox all the time. It also can lead to phishing attacks and phishing with the pH, where they're trying to steal your information. But cookies do have a good purpose. So let's say, I always use the example of Macy's. You go to Macy's and let's say you're searching for men's watches. Well, the next time you go to Macy's, and they, if they happen to have a sale on men's watches, it's going to get a pop-up and say, oh, 20% off on men's watches this week. How do they know? Well, as you go to the website and that web page is loading, it's loading these snippets of code that then track where you are on their website. One other interesting thing about Macy's site is they'll track where you go once you leave their site. So let's say you leave Macy's site and you go to Nordstrom's and you find a similar watch, maybe not as good quality, but it's cheaper by $20. They use that information to then determine what they're gonna purchase in stock in their store next time around. Good marketing, but in the same token, that's how a lot of hackers also steal information as well. So one of the things that's always important 
is learning how to clear the cache of your browser where those cookies are stored. It's a good idea to clear that per out periodically. And each browser has a different way of doing that. The best way is simply Google it for your browser, clear the cache, Google Chrome. And it walks you through it. It's a couple steps. Next, we'll talk about popular social media sites. The top five popular media so uh, social media sites. First one is Facebook, with an estimated 900 million unique visitors every month. Second is Twitter, with 310 unique estimated visitors every month. And it's estimated because these companies don't divulge that information as part of their trade secret, but they can tell a lot by volume. There's a big difference between number one and number two. Facebook is still leader when it comes to driving people to a one location. Number three is LinkedIn, or as my kids call it, the uh, old people's version of Facebook. And that's 255 million. LinkedIn's an interesting site because everyone's either CEO or president, CFO, CIO. There's no one ever posts anything that says, hey, I'm just a general worker here. So. Then there's Pinterest, which is a popular site for uploading pictures that has 250, unique million, uh, 50, 250 million unique visitors every month. And then there's Google Plus at 120 million. And we'll discuss Google Plus a little bit later because that's a interesting, um, it's an interesting social media site. How many people here have a Gmail account? Everybody. So if you have a Gmail account, you already have a Google Plus account whether you know it or not. Your kids know it. I've given this talk enough to know that they not only know it, but they use it on a regular basis. And I'll show you how to get around them uh, because they're trying to get around you. And that information is as of um, this month. And that comes from eBiz. Uh, MBA.com. It's a really good website to check periodically. Um, I do have it in the handout. And they have a lot of good content with regards to, with regards to this type of information. Be a friend, and friend is in quotes there, to your child's online account. What does that mean? Well, most social media sites allow you to follow a particular person or a particular group or user. And that usually gives you the option to get notifications when they update their status or post new information. Any of you who have friends on Facebook that love to put up pictures every hour or tell you, you know, hey, now I have a cold, and you get these weird notifications, it happens a lot. Kids love to get notifications because it makes them feel like they're included or part of a larger group. But here's the thing, it, if it's important enough for your child to have an account on one of these social media sites, it's even more important for you to have an account as well, okay? You should have an account on Facebook if your kid has an account on Facebook. And even if you don't do anything but you're uh, following that account, you need to know what they're posting and also have the ability to see what other people are posting to them. One quick note is that you have to be 13 years or older to join most social media websites, like Facebook. Why is that important? Because if your eight-year-old is on Facebook and they do something wrong, you are liable. Not only legally, but financially as well. And you're really not off the hook till they hit 18. New statistic is that two out of three Divorces in the U.S. can be directly attributed to social media. Now, most people look at that and they get shocked, like, how on earth? But it's really easy for you online, Facebook, to reacquaint yourself with your old high school flame 20 years ago, and it happens more often than not. And that scary number is just in, blows my mind that it's happening that often. 
And that source is from Computers in uh, Human Behavior from July of 2014. Uh, they post a new survey or a new um, information every two years. So this July, there should be another um, study that comes out. I have a feeling we're going to see that number even get higher as social media becomes more and more prevalent in everything we do. Next thing we'll discuss is internet use. So you have a home network, but is it safe? That's one of the topics. Where do your kids use the internet? Kids' websites and know your history. And I'll discuss what that means, because history is in quotes. Uh, so you have a home network, uh, but is it safe? And what do I mean by that? Um, it depends on how you connect to the internet. Most people either plug a cable directly into a box that they get from Comcast or CenturyLink or any one of the internet providers. That's a hard line connection. Or else you connect wirelessly to a wireless router that's connected to that box, or it could be part of that box that you get from Comcast or CenturyLink. Depending on how you connect, offers different levels of security to your home network. A hardwired connection is much more secure than a wireless connection. It's also easier to maintain the security on a hardlined or hardwired connection than a wireless connection. Now this next one, I'm going to bring up two terms that usually most people's eyes glaze over if they have no IT experience, but the question is, do you have a firewall or a content filter installed on your home network? A firewall, basically, what it sounds like, prevents things from coming into your home network, or a content filter, which filters out what it does, content, from entering your home network. Now that could be either a physical device you hook up to your home network, or it could be software based. It could also be settings set up within that little device you get from Comcast or CenturyLink to help filter content and provide up extra security, which is the firewall. So I'm gonna discuss um, a couple different options, and I know most people are saying, well, pff, I'm not a computer person, I'm not a, computer guru, so what are my options, okay? I'm gonna discuss three, um, and they're all very good, very reliable, and um, one is actually free, okay? One is called OpenDNS. OpenDNS is uh, basically a series of servers that you change the settings for in your box that you receive from Comcast or CenturyLink and it filters the data coming in and out of your home network. They have a free option, which is very good. They have a paid option, which is very, very good. Uh, their paid option is, last time I checked, $20 a month. The free option is just that it's free. And if you call CenturyLeak or Comcast, they will help you set that up. You basically go to the website, create an account, you get the DNS server, which is domain name server, DNS. And you change what you have for CenturyLink or Comcast information in that box they give you. You put in their information, and then you set the level online as to how you much content and type of content you want to filter. Filter things like social media sites, gambling, uh, drugs, pornography, chat sites, all kinds of things. And you have the option then to control that. You even have the option that when someone tries to access one of those types of sites, you can have a personal message comes up on their screen. Mom and dad said no, don't go there again. The next one is a company called Covenant Eyes. And Covenant Eyes takes a different approach. It's software based. And the software, once you install it, you can password protect it so it can't be removed from the machine. So if you install it on a kid's machine, it cannot be taken off without the master password. But what it does is you can set up who gets a weekly report. So let's say 
take my, my son for example, Zach. I'm going to have Zach go online. He has going through all this content on, you know, Covenant Eyes tracks everything. But at the end of the week, I get a report saying, Zach went to this many websites. He spent this much time on the internet. This is the type of sites. These sites were adult related. These sites were general related, like a G type website. So then you can sit down and have that conversation. And it's also good for the other person knowing that someone else is going to be watching their online activity. Uh, last time I checked, Covenant Eyes was $14.95 a month. I believe that covered a couple machines, two or three machines. That may have changed recently, I don't know. But we can, you can always check by going to their website. Another one is called Clean Router. It's very similar to Covenant Eyes. Um, they take a little different approach. They're not so much about sending out the email as they are blocking things coming in and out. So not only can you block pornography from coming into your home network, but if your child tries to send or text, if they're using the Wi-Fi at home, um, personal information, it can block that as well from going out. Things like if it notices anything in a remotely format, so like a social security number or an address or a phone number, it'll prevent that from actually going out. And I believe that one is also twenty dollars a month. So does it does. It does block uh, things as well, but it gives you a report that they were trying to access those websites. Yeah, it, yeah. It'd be silly if they just let it all go through. So next, where do your kids use the internet? And I get a lot of parents who think this section. They don't really think about it until I start going through things, but is the area easily accessible to others? That's pretty important. Or is the area in a private location, like a bedroom or a bathroom? Everyone gives me this weird look when I say bathroom. But these days, between cell phones and tablets, tablets have replaced magazines for most people that can access the internet. And if you can access the internet, you can access inappropriate content. And when you're by yourself, you feel safe and secure to do whatever you want. Who's going to know, right? Well, that's really important when kids are in their teens because they're trying to understand who they are. They're trying to figure out how they fit into the world. And, you know, what's the big deal about pornography? It's important to have a designated place in your house where your kids can use the computer and that space being accessible to others. If they know that someone can walk in on them at any one point in time and see what they're doing, even if it's at the kitchen table, they're less likely to even go to an inappropriate website. Next thing we'll talk about are kids' websites. Most kids' websites are safe and contain age-appropriate information. Companies like Disney, Microsoft, even Google spend a lot of time and money making sure that kids' content is safe for kids. But the other side of things is kids' websites are also targeted by advertisers. Okay? And some of the advertisements on kids' websites are not necessarily age-appropriate to fit the content of the page. A lot of those companies that sell online advertising sell, sell them in blocks of 10,000, 100,000. They don't go through each one individually. They let the individual advertiser say, kid appropriate, non, you know, non-age appropriate, what the range is. Some of them intentionally are targeting your kids at the age of 13. 14. It's important to never assume that people in chat rooms on kids' websites are kids. It's especially true on kids' websites because they are targeted. It takes absolutely no time for me to register an account on Disney.com and pretend I'm 13-year-old Susie. How do you know? By that account myself. I could be whoever I want. Pedophiles know that. 
and pedophiles will take time to build up a rapport with the child online. They're very patient. And like I said earlier, I spent a lot of time on Darknet researching this and dealing with people who are pedophiles to find out what they do and why they do it. And they're more than happy to share. And they're very good. They're very good at hiding their tracks. And they create what they call a digital profile of your child. They will take, some of them will take a year to get to know your child online and to get your child feel comfortable, comfortable with them. And they'll find out things like where you live, phone number, where your mom and dad work, what time they get home from work, what school you go to, what time school gets off, do you like sports, don't like sports, the other kids pick on you, well you don't have to worry about that, I'm gonna be your friend. To get them feeling safe and luring them into a, into a situation where um, your kids will definitely not understand or know how to deal with. This next one is very, very important. Teach your kids to never share personal information online, even if it's the other person is a friend. And that's so important, I bold it. Because what happens? Yeah, they're sharing information with a friend online. Once that information leaves your computer, you have absolutely no control over it. And you may be really good at keeping your information safe, but how positive are you that your child's friends and their family are really good about keeping that information safe? Good question. Is that related like social security or data work or? Anything, yeah, anything like that of a personal nature, never share it online. If it's important enough for you to give it to somebody else, do it either in person or over the phone. At least over the phone, the only people listening are the NSA. You know. So, so not, I mean, not just for kids, but for adults. For adults, yeah. Saying somebody emails you and asks for your address, call on the phone and give it to them, or is these email different from emails emails a little different than chat rooms but still if it's if it's something that if the information is something that if got out in the public it can cause you financial or harm in some way make a phone call that's a good rule of thumb these days especially now you know it's bank information is flying around you know you're doing a mortgage that paperwork's going back and forth you know you can always request to do things in person. It's just our lives have become so hectic we tend to bypass that step. What about on Facebook when they post their phone number? If you post anything on Facebook, if you ever read the little blurb that looks like this big, but it's actually 30 pages long, that was drafted by a whole team of attorneys, Facebook is not responsible for anything you post. You are. And if you post it on Facebook, expect even people who don't have friends of your account, just because you're not a friend of someone's account doesn't mean that they can't see your data. They're actually, in fact, there's actually chat rooms out there that teach you how to access that information from people's accounts who are, you are not friends from. These companies that go and do profile background searches on people online for colleges and for employers, they're not friends in my Facebook account, but they can access everything I put on there. It's actually quite simple. So if it's, like I said, if it's not something you would stick on a sticky note and leave at the local Starbucks, don't put it online. That's that's one of those conversations you have to educate your kids about. We teach them how to act one-on-one -on -one with people, you need to teach your kids what's appropriate behavior online and what your expectations are. And that goes into another section I have a little bit later uh, on you know, internet accountability. And what does that mean? And we'll go into that. So know your history. Know what your kids are doing online, okay? Every browser has a history tab. 
where you can check to see where you've gone when you've been online. It tracks where you've gone. It's convenient. Oh, I forgot what website was I at yesterday or I saw that one item I wanted to buy. You can go to the history and find it. So you want to check the history on your computers on a regular basis. A telltale sign that there's something going on is if you go to check the history on your computer and it's constantly empty. If you know your kid's been online on the computer, but there's no digital footprint as to where they were going in the browser, you have to, you have to ask yourself, what are they hiding? And so it's important to become familiar with the parental controls on your computer. It doesn't matter whether you're using Windows, Linux, Apple OS X, whatever, they all have parental controls built into them. If you don't know how to use the parental controls to restrict things, like what parts of the computer they can access, how long they can access the internet, things like that, um, do a simple Google search or go to YouTube. There's videos that show you how. The internet's a great resource for a lot of things. It also gives you access to a lot of things you don't want access to. So you might as well use it to your advantage. The next section we're going to talk about is pornography. Okay. So who does pornography affect? Types of pornography. What can I do? with regards to pornography, and then internet accountability and the unfiltered DVD. So I don't know if um, how many of you folks received the unfiltered DVD from the Archdiocese, so last year, year before that. Um, they handed these out to uh, at least all the elementary schools that I'm aware of. If you don't have it and you want a copy, you can always call the Archdiocese office and ask them to send you one or you can go pick them up. It has a book, a parent's guide, and it has a DVD that goes through information. Um, it also gives you, it's, it's put out by uh, the company Covenant Eyes we talked about earlier, so they do promote their, their services, but the content in that DVD is very, very good. So, who does pornography affect? It affects boys and girls, but especially teens. Why especially teens? Because in their teens, that's when their brain is really reformat, reformatting itself. It goes through a lot of chemical changes. Uh, a lot of things get rewired. And uh, even when your teen doesn't seem like they're listening to you, they actually are. They're just choosing not to acknowledge it. Um, So even if your kids aren't looking for pornography, pornography, pornography is specifically out there trying to target them when they're online. Uh, these companies are really good. It doesn't take them long to determine who's a 45-year-old or someone in their 40s online by the websites they go to versus who's in their teens. And they target those specific sites that the teens frequent. The kids are playing Minecraft online, they're going to Facebook, there are certain places on Facebook that teens like to frequent. The pornographers are aware of that. Pornography is a multi-billion dollar industry and it's all driven by money and they have a lot of people who do nothing but program and social engineer their sites to get the attention of your kids. And why is that? Well, I'll go through that a little bit more, just a little bit here, but over 25% of teens have unintentionally been exposed to pornography when they've been online and they haven't been looking for it. Um, that goes back to these companies and how they're marketing to your kids. The average age a child is exposed to pornography is 11 years old. And it's not that they're searching for it, but they go to play a game and you get these ads on the side 
and the ad might seem innocent enough. It may be someone in a business suit, and the next thing you know, for one second, it flashes to people in their underwear. Just enough to get your kids' attention to click on that link and take them to a site that is no longer age appropriate. And that type of information is covered in this unfiltered DVD. And we'll discuss why that's really important under types of pornography. Um, there are all kinds of pornography, all types of pornography, from soft pornography to the really hardcore stuff. Um, but pornography is used as a hook for young kids and teens. And the reason it's used as a hook is because pornography is addictive. Um, the unfiltered DVD goes through it. There is a lot of research out there um, over the last 10 to 15 years. Pornography has the same effect on a teenager's brain as heroin. It releases the same types of endorphins into the brain as a heroin addict in encounters when they're taking heroin. Well, the pornography industry knows that. And just like the drug dealer gives the first little bit away for free, they know that that person's eventually going to come back to try to get that same euphoric feeling, and they're going to be willing to pay for it. And they're also going to want more, because they're going to need more, to try to get that same feeling again. Same thing with pornography. That's why pornography has multiple levels, from the very soft type of pornography to stuff you can't even fathom on Darknet where a lot of the really nasty stuff lives. So as a parent, you say, what can I do? It's really important to establish internet accountability at home. And what, what does that basically mean? It means having the expectations. You sit down with your child and say, these are my expectations as your parent as to what you are allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do when you're on the internet. If you're going to use the internet, it needs to be in a location in the house that everyone has access to. You need to be able to go through and say, hey, like my kids, we have a, a, a policy in place at home. If I ask for my child's cell phone, they have to give it to me and unlock it. If they refuse to, I immediately turn it off for a week. Most cell phone carriers, you can get online to the online interface and shut a number down so they can't receive phone calls or texts or use the internet. That's the expectation I have with them. They only push that boundary once. After that, they go through severe withdrawal when they don't have their little texting device. And remember, you can't prevent your kids from using the internet. And I'm not saying go out there and be the Grinch with your parents and have that heavy glove. Because your kids are going to sit there and say, well, mom and dad are just picking on me. They don't trust me. That's not it. You explain to them the reason you do this is not because you don't trust them, but because you love them. And that your primary obligation as a parent is, one, to make sure they make it to heaven, and two, is to make sure they're safe. And although you trust them, explain to them that you don't trust everybody else on the internet. And they'll understand that. It's also important to talk to your kids. And talking to your kids isn't easy, I get it. My son, who is 14, has mastered the ability to have a conversation with one word answers. How was your day? Good. What'd you do today? Nothing. Why am I sending you to Catholic school? I don't know. You know, it's kind of funny. So sometimes you have to talk to them or communicate to them in their comfort zone. I was reminded of that this weekend when I started talking to my son. He was playing a video game. Now, video games from when I was a kid and video games to now are two very different things. So I said, hey, I'll play, the, I'll play this game with you. And he stopped, he paused the game, which is a first. And he turned around and he gave me the controller, set it up so I could play it, and explained to me how to use it, which went in one ear and out the other. 
But that's okay, because I sat there letting him trounce his father on this game, but for one hour he opened up and talked to me about everything going on in school, who is what is doing with his friends, and what's happening in his life that he considers important. That one hour was worth my ego getting crushed on the game. Okay? Last thing I have on this slide is take parenting seriously. And what I mean by that is be proactive. If you don't ask your kids the questions, they're not going to give you the answers. Especially teenagers. Because as a teenager, they have all the answers. And they're not wanting and sharing it with mom and dad. Next topic is um, internet accountability. Okay. So if you don't have a copy of the unfiltered DVD, I, I do recommend you get it from the Archdiocese. If not, you can go to Covenant Eyes website and request it for free. They're happy to send it to you because it's their marketing material. But they have a lot of really good information on there to share with your family. Some of the content isn't... Yeah, I would watch it first um, by yourself, or you and your spouse watch it together, um, and then determine, you know, it's definitely age appropriate for a teenager, younger kids maybe not so much. Because they do talk about some of the things regarding pornography and some of that stuff you just might not want to share with your younger, younger kids. It's important to talk to your kids about the contents of the DVD too. Don't just watch it, but actually talk to them about it and get their take on it. Because one thing I found through my own kids is they look at everything from a very different lens than I do. So what I think is important, they're like, Dad, that's nothing. And what I'm like, well, this is nothing. Like, oh, Dad, you need to pay attention to this. I'm like, why? And then they'll sit there and explain it to me. And I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> really? That's what your generation thinks about things. Okay. The other thing to realize is, no, you're not alone. We're very fortunate that we belong or, to a Catholic faith and that we're sending our kids to a Catholic school. We have great resources. Father Paul is a great resource. Deacon Historic, the teachers here. But also we have each other as parents. When my son was a freshman going through and experiencing things, I didn't have the answer. I didn't know what to expect. But talking to other parents who their youngest child was the freshman in the family gave me some really good advice because they'd been through that. So it's important to use each other as a resource. And sometimes it's hard. We don't want to talk about what our kids are doing sometimes. But I'd rather take a blow to my ego and have my kid be on the right track than sit back and watch my kid go down the wrong one. Okay? The fourth topic we're going to discuss are cell phones or smartphones. I don't like calling them smartphones because I don't think they're very smart. But... Um, the topics we'll discuss is what can you do with the cell phone? Applications, or as my kids say, dead, they're apps. And can a cell phone work without a service plan? So what can you do with the cell phone? Well, as we already discussed in the beginning in this quick quiz, the cell phone is basically these days a small computer. Okay, if your cell phone is from 2009 or new newer, it is four times more power than the first Cray supercomputer created back in the late 80s. That's a lot of computing power in your pocket. So you can do things like play games on them, you can text on them, you can run applications on them, and to the absolute surprise of my kids, you can talk on these things too. So cell phones can and do track your movements um, with their built-in GPS. You can turn a GPS off, but you can still track your movements through what's known as pinging and triangulation between cell towers. That's how the old cell, t uh, old cell phones used to connect as you're going through, driving down the street, 
it's sending out a signal and waiting for the next fastest signal to come back and it knows oh I got this signal back first that's the next cell tower I'm going to connect to so you're not driving along and in every quarter mile having to redial and continue your conversation cell phones just like tablets and computers have the power to consume our lives and they do I'm thoroughly convinced you can go into a Starbucks and completely rob it blind between the hours of 7 and 9 a.m. and no one even know you were there. Next time you go into a coffee shop like Starbucks in the morning, walk in and before you order, take a look around. I do this all the time, it just amuses me. Everyone's either on the phone, on a tablet, or on the computer, and they're in their own little world, zoned out. When that happens in your life, you know you have too much of yourself invested in that little piece of equipment. Next, we're going to talk about applications or apps and the top five smartphone applications used by teens. And that's key. Number one is Facebook. Still by far the number one application used by teens. Number two is YouTube. Kids spend a lot of time out there watching the videos on YouTube. Number three is Google Plus. And remember, it was number five on our previous uh, list of social media sites. But as far as apps that kids use, Google Plus is number three. And it's starting to creep up the list. A couple years ago was number five. Why is that? Google Plus has what they call circles. And circles are basically, for a good analogy, you can use it as a bucket. You have a friend's bucket, a friend's circle, a family circle, a co-worker circle. You can create your own circles. And in a talk I gave about a year ago, I had a mom said, well, you know, my daughter is on Google Plus and I'm part of, you know, part of the, her, her family group on there and she never even uses it. Well, we started digging a little further and found out not only was her daughter using it, her daughter was using it about 25 times a day. But you see, mom was in the family group, and the daughter was texting to the friends group. And if you're not in that group or circle, you don't receive the texts and the information sent to that circle. So if your kids are on Google+, make sure you're part of every circle they have in Google+. That may mean you're going to get a lot of weird information floating across your computer. But maybe it's a good thing to find out ahead of time that your child's in a spat with another student or they're being picked on by another student with cyberbullying, which is very common. And you can prevent that before it gets out of hand. Number four is a tie between WeChat and Twitter. Most people have heard of Twitter where you send out quick little snippets of uh, text to people who are tracking you or following you. WeChat is very similar. The only difference is you can choose who to send the chats to. They don't have to necessarily even be part of WeChat. You can send it to someone's email account and it's anonymous. It's a cool little app that allows you to pick on someone without them necessarily knowing who you are. Number five is a three-way tie. Kick, Yik Yak, and Burn Note. If your kids have Kick on their computer or on their cell phone or on their tablet, delete it. I have yet to find anything good happening on Kick. Kick is an instant messaging service that you can send pictures to people within a radius of your device in quote unquote anonymous it's used a lot um, by teenage girls specifically for the purpose of sexting which is the number one use amongst teens right now to send anything from text to the big thing that's popular is teenage girls sending pictures of themselves nude from the neck down to the shoulders to a quote-unquote boy they like. Not something they would do in front of that person, 
But again, teens tend to feel anonymous when they're online. Yik Yak is a texting type application where you can send a text anonymously or non-anonymously for a certain amount of time. That text is available for five minutes, 10 minutes, whatever. Bird Note is brand new. And it's a pretty interesting app. It looks like something that miss, would have come out of the government. But basically, you can send a message to another person on Bird Note. And everyone has a account name. You don't use your own name in the messages. But your message comes across in the app, and it's a black screen. And as you run your finger across the screen, the message appears in a little spotlight. When you get to the end of the message, it's gone. Pretty cool. How do these, Snapchat, Snapchat is popular amongst the younger kids, believe it or not. Not so much amongst the teens. It was a couple years ago, but it's dropped popularity. Um, Snapchat, to give an idea, right now on the list of things is number 11. But it's good that you know that. Because as you talk to your kids, you find out which applications are important to them. Just because these are the most used doesn't mean they're the ones being used by your kids. So having that conversation. Snapchat is popular out here, but in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't rank in the top 10. Does Snapchat like burn note where you see a message and then it's gone? Snapchat allows you to send a message or a picture um, for X amount of time. Here's the thing, and the kids don't realize this. Let's say Susie sends a picture of herself with no clothes on. She figures, oh, I'm going to be out there for 30 seconds. What's going to happen, right? Fun, 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 ha, ha, ha. In that 30 seconds, it doesn't prevent someone from taking a screenshot on their phone. In fact, it doesn't prevent them from then taking that screenshot and posting it up on Facebook and say, hey, look at Susie. Kids usually don't think it through that far. But that's what happened uh, last year um, in October, if I remember correctly, down in Pueblo. I don't know if you're familiar with that story where the kids were sharing and doing sexting and sharing pictures inappropriate pictures. And what these girls weren't realizing is these boys they were sending these pictures to were saving them and archiving them and sharing them. And then they were upset that they were doing that. If you send it to the internet, expect everyone to see it. And one thing about the internet is it's not like it's one place you can go to in a room and get the data back and delete it. You're talking millions and millions of servers across the world, and you don't know which one is on what. Since you brought that up, mm -hmm. so they, they were on an app, like at least one of the news reports mm -hmm. I saw, that it was a calculator app. Mm -hmm. And so if the child had the right number combination, that was the old, the, even the parents who were apparently checking their kids' phones. Mm -hmm couldn't find them because they, they never suspected mm -hmm. this would be under a calculator app, right? Mm -hmm. So is there some, I don't know, like from all the experience you have, it's like a telltale if this app's on the phone, like maybe be suspicious. I mean, how are you mm -hmm. supposed to figure that out? Really? It's hard because there are new apps that come out every day. And as someone who tracks this stuff on a regular basis, I have a hard time keeping up with the latest and greatest. And that's why I go on a dark net, dark web, however you want to call it, to find out from these people who actually put these things together how they use it. Because there's a lot of innocent applications that are out there that are being used in non-innocent ways. Um, and I know what you're talking about. It's a calculator app where it actually has a secret storage on your phone that's encrypted. And you put the right number combination to unlock that encryption to view what's there. Honestly, if you find an app on your kid's phone, write it down and research it. Um, the websites, there are websites out there that'll tell you what you can and cannot do with these apps. And there's other parents out there who post, um, you know, 
Have you encountered this with this app? Oh yeah, this app can do this and this, and my caught my son sending pictures with this and hiding things with that. So again, use that internet, use Google. Google's a great resource. It really is. Google knows more about me than I know about me. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Instagram is on my list here. Number 14. Instagram, yeah, they have a lot of information with um, pictures and stuff like that, posting that. And you can actually uh, password protect the content you put up there. Same thing with Pinterest or Tumblr. Tumblr was a real popular one a couple years ago. It's, it's now six on the list. Used to be number three. Um, a lot of adult content on both of those sites. Um, so it, it comes back to having that conversation with your child and uh, what internet accountability is, what it means to you, what your expectations are, and what the consequences are if they were to violate those expectations. And, you know, explain to them. It's, again, if you take it from the perspective of I'm your parent, you're going to do what I say. They'll turn off instantly. They will. Explain to them you're not doing it to be mean, you're doing it because you care, and that you don't trust the other folks out there on the internet. And that's true. You're doing it because you care. If you didn't care, you wouldn't be sending them to Catholic school. There's a cheaper alternative down the street called the public school, where they can fight their way onto the bus and then fight their way off the bus. As I said before, most teens feel anonymous when they're using a smartphone and when they're online in general. They really do. They think there's a certain level of anonymity, which really doesn't exist. It's important to know how to remotely wipe your smartphone. Um, there's apps out there. Um, one's called Lookout. It's a freeware, or it's a application. It's not freeware. It, it, there's a free component, but there's a paid component as well. It'll run on Android. It'll run on iPhone. There's a Vast, which will run on um, Android as well as iPhone and the Windows Phone. There's iCloud which is for the iPhone or iOS device. And then the undercover is also, if you have an iPhone, undercover is better than iCloud. Because not only can you remotely wipe the phone, and what I mean by wipe the phone is different than factory reset your phone. Factory resetting your phone, your data can still be retrieved off that phone. Wiping your phone literally formats the solid state information on that phone, reformats it to an original factory state, and then factory resets it. That's the only way you can guarantee the data is no longer there. Undercover is probably the better of I, between iCloud and for the iOS device. I know a lot of people have iPhones, because not only does it allow you to wipe the phone, but it allows you to continue to track the phone after you wipe it. You could do all kinds of things like set off alarms, have it say every five minutes a personal message, hey, this my phone is stolen, why are you taking me? It's kind of funny. I've seen that happen in a restaurant where a person's, the phone went off and they were running out the door trying to figure out how to get rid of this thing. And then there's Prey. Prey is a freeware application. It'll run on iPhone, Android, or Windows phone. Um, it is a little bit more tricky to set up, but it's very powerful. You can literally disable the, um, the uh, antenna and the radio controller on the phone so it can't even receive a signal. Essentially bricking the phone and making it useless. Next topic, can a cell phone work without a service plan? Cell phones and smartphones as well as iPods, um, your iPad, Microsoft Surface, um, they all can work without a service plan. They all can access the internet. If you have the ability to access the internet or access wireless, you have the ability to go online and access things like pornography, those sorts of things. Open and free wireless internet access can be found in uh, a lot of popular places these days. Uh, restaurants, coffee shops, uh, the library is a big one, the mall. One thing to be aware of at the library, 
Your kids go to the library a lot. You can't figure out why because they don't ever like reading books. It's because they're accessing the internet. The internet is unrestricted and unfiltered in the library under free speech rights. So it's not unusual to be walking through the library and seeing someone accessing adult content. Just keep that in mind. And the last topic we have is have a plan. And what does that mean? Remember, it's important to have a plan in place for checking your kids' online life. Remember the internet accountability. At the end of the day, you need to be the parent. And sometimes you've got to be firm with that. They might not understand it. They might hate it. But later on in life, I guarantee you, they'll thank you for it. It's important, remember, to talk and ask questions and let your kids know what is safe and good behavior when they're online. They don't know unless you tell them. You wouldn't put your kids in the car and give them the keys and say, go for it. You're going to teach them how to drive. Teach them how to use the internet. Teach them what's good behavior. And then talk to other parents. If you're encountering something, hey, have you heard of this app or this website? I'm guaranteed other parents have heard of it or have had a deal with it at one point or another. And remember, this is really important. At the end of the day, really, only we are responsible for our kids um, and their safety online. The companies aren't responsible for it. They don't necessarily have your best interest in mind or your kids' best interest in mind. They're a business, and they're in business to make money. And if that means it's coming through your kid or through you, they really don't care. Okay? That's it. Questions?